across the U.S. Find out how you can participate in the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. With Russ Evans, this is Shannon Nordstrom thanking you for tuning in to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show. Have a great day, and remember, PTLA. The opinions heard on this program, based on the many years of experience of Russ and Shannon, are offered for entertainment value only and as a guide to your repair needs. No claim to repair or cause is given or implied. Always consult with your own certified technician and follow all safety procedures before attempting any repair. To be a part of the show, call 866-594-4150. Under the Hood is produced by Prairie House Productions. All content is the property of Nordstrom's Automotive Incorporated and may not be used without our permission. Copyright Nordstrom's Automotive Inc. Now, let's go under the hood with the Nordstrom's Motor Medics. Welcome to the Under the Hood Show. We are glad to have you with us. Russ Evans is here to answer your automotive questions. Thanks for joining us under the hood. Shannon Nordstrom is here to do the same. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. I'm Chris Carter here to answer your calls at 866-594-4150. 866-594-4150. While we were getting all started, we had some calls coming in, one from Oklahoma, and it seems like we should get to that. Yeah, because, it's a good place to be. Yeah, I think so, especially in winter. Where we are, it would be much better to be in Oklahoma, I think. Let's talk to Rod. You're on the end of the hood show. Rod, what can we do for you? Yeah, I got a 95 Chevy pickup, 1500. Um, coolant line came off, and I basically lost a bunch of fluid, and I don't think it disturbed the transmission that much, but after I got the line fixed and filled it back up, I got a hard hit in, like, second gear, like either the servo or the accumulator, and I don't know if that can be repaired, like, without taking the whole transmission out, just take that accumulator apart or the, or the servo out. And my question is, is it going to drop that band if I pull that out? And uh, I know the lip seals are probably hard, and I don't have a heat shield on it right there, so I would probably got it pretty hot, and that's probably the what it occurred. Yeah, uh, I, I'm just... We've had this happen before on a few of them recently, and so to get in there, I mean, a lot of people are still driving these vehicles, and, and you need to take the pan off in order to do that, and then you can get in there, and you should be able to replace that with it still in the vehicle by taking the pan off and getting in there. Some of the operations require pulling the valve body out, too, to, in order to get in there to that band and everything, but you should be able to do that in chassis just to swap that out. It just depends on, like you said, how hot it got. You might have damage to other items, but... You know, if you're willing to give that a shot and change parts while it's in the vehicle, see if it if it smooths it out a little bit, it might might be worth a shot. Well, it's definitely your option too. I mean, that's the that's the card you want to play if you don't want to get more expensive. You got to try, and if it doesn't work, you're kind of in the same place where you started. And so that's a tough place to be though. Yeah. Sometimes when you're just not sure what when the line broke, what uh, do you figure out? Identify what happened there? Did it just age out and break, or or, or was there work done and something didn't stay seated? What what happened? Uh, yeah, I think the the where it was flared, it wasn't flared. It was just over tightened, and it, the flare didn't hold, and it was just barely leaking. And basically, the whole line popped off while I was going down the road, and I'm like, mm. so I had to get another radiator already. And uh, and I, you know, I put a line on there on the end of a line, and then just put a rubber hose from my old line to that line, and to repair the problem on that. So it, it I mean, it ships and everything and works, but it's just got an intermittent, sometimes second gear bump real hard, sometimes slams real hard. Like it, it might even have broke the accumulator spring. It's, it could have maybe, you know, yeah. melted. <laughs> Well, I don't think it would have melted. I, I mean, it's pretty simple transmission. It's a 4L60E that's in that. Mm-hmm. You know, so um, I'm I'm assuming, I mean, I know I can't get the band out unless I pull the pump and the whole transmission out. But, right. I mean, I'm trying to figure out if, if I pull that servo accumulator out, take the snap ring off and pull that assembly out, I'm wondering if that band's going to actually mislocate in there and where I can't get the pin to go back into the band when I put it back together. That's my 
forte yeah. right there that I don't know about. <laughs> I don't remember ever doing one except for when it's tipped on its side when it's out of the vehicle. But, you know, you could look on YouTube and watch them doing that in chassis and see what, oh, yeah. what the, what the tip is. That. Yeah, because, you know, everything we've done, we've done on its side. You know, I, I can remember going all the way back into the early 80s, and I had a turbo 350 that was bad in one of my friend's cars, and it wouldn't go anywhere. We'd burn it up trying to drive too fast, you know, and... and we just decided, well, can't we just pull it out and, and rebuild it ourselves? And we did that because we didn't know we couldn't. We had no <laughs> idea what was in there. And it's nothing compared to today's transmissions, but we just yanked that thing out of a 79 Grand Prix and tore it all down on the floor of a really dirty shop, <laughs> looked at the pieces that were worn out, tore another transmission down that worked out of a truck, and then mixed and matched and made everything look good and bolted it all back together and that then, darn thing worked great, man. It, 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 it worked. The only problem we had with it is, like you said, you have a hard shift sometimes. This thing shifted like yeah. snap your neck hard in every gear, but that's what we wanted. <laughs> right, right. That Lots didn't have an MT200 in it? That didn't have a metric 200 in that year? No, because this engine had been swapped. Originally, it had a 204R in it um, that had been swapped from, a new, from an 82, I think it was. But the the first one was a metric 200 in that. But this one ended up with a – it was a Pontiac Grand Prix, but it had a Chevy 350 in it and a 350 Trans. I think it came out of a like a 77 or 78 Camaro. Does that yeah, help you? That was, a, that was a good year. <laughs> Does that get you moving in the right direction there, Rod? Yeah, I think I'll go YouTube it or whatever, you Google it or something and see if I could find something on there and – and I'll, I'll tinker with it. I haven't tried to pull it apart yet, but, I mean, I'm thinking I, I, it can be accomplished, but I hope, you know, I don't, it's not a daily driver, but sure. it is what it is. Well, you you also want to get it, I, you want to get it fixed just so it's fixed. That's a, I think, Russ, you guys, I think that's a, a thing that doesn't get talked about enough with car repairs. A, a lot of calls we get. It's not that it needs to be fixed. It's not that a car you need to have. Right. You just want it to if, work if right. If you own it, let's make it work. Yeah. If, or, I, if I've got all this stuff around, I want all that stuff to work, or let's get rid of it. Or if, even if you're not doing anything with it, it it's, and it's sitting in your garage, whatever it is. You know what I mean? Let, yeah, I know it works. A it's good sitting example, in my garage. I think of this with guitars. All of my guitars I, that I can't play, even if they're strung the wrong hand for my daughter, if a string breaks and it's sitting on the wall and it's an old guitar that I got for $8 that doesn't matter, I still want to put the strings in it because I want it to sit there. I want it to not work or not be played or driven because I choose it, not because <laughs> I exactly, haven't taken care exactly. of it. Exactly. <laughs> you know, you own three cars and you take two of them apart to rob for parts for the other one. Uh -huh. Just get rid of those two cars and save a few spare parts on the shelf. What if you have a third one that runs great? For a while, and that you sh I should just get rid of that one too, shouldn't I? Probably. I it's like it's it. in the eye of the <laughs> owner. Let them do what they please. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. 866 594 4150. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show.
Be sure to visit our website for news, contests, and previous shows at underthehoodshow.com. Welcome back, everybody. It's time to get back under the hood with the Motor Medics. 866-594-4150. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show. Let's go back to Mississippi and talk to Terrell. We've talked to Terrell before. Terrell, you're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Hey, how you doing? Good. What can we do yeah, for you this time? Uh, I got a, uh, yeah, I got a, uh, something like a uh, 2015 Toyota Tacoma. Four-wheel drive. I got a V8 in it. I keep getting the right rear speed since the code still you know, 210. Uh, is that something you to go out? Is it going to be more in-depth in there? I read something about, you know, the action seal to go out and be with, um, uh, contaminating the sensor or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes. Most of the time, we find when we find a problem with those, it's a physical thing. We can look at it and see it without even using a scanner. I mean, once we know what it is, of course, we, we don't need a scanner do any more repairs. We'll see uh, the wire broken close to the rear on the axle. They just can kind of get corroded down there, and they're super thin, so they break easy. And then hey, You the, think they'd use something more heavy-duty in that exposed area a lot of times? Yeah. I mean, I've got we've got a video game controller in here that's got a thicker cord for the controller <laughs> than, than that thing has, exactly. beaten up by the road and debris and weather and stuff. But, um, yeah, you know, we'll see those broken, and then also the sensor issues. And if you get an axle seal that's leaking on the end, it can contaminate it, get in there, and then that, that fluid and a little bit of metal contamination and rust all kicks that thing out back there. You know, there's a little magnet in there, and that can that can break and fail. So just you know, sometimes taking it apart and do a physical inspection. So if you if you go back there and you, you you unplug it and you read it, and it's got the same resistance as the driver's side, then you know the coil in the sensor's working. So then we've got to, you know, you might – Decide instead of taking stuff apart first, go all the way up to the ABS hydraulic control unit and check the resistance there of both the rear sensors. And if they're both exactly the, you know, pretty much the same, because one's a couple feet longer than the other going to the other side and the axle there on the right, but they should be pretty close. Um, then you'd want to take it apart and do that physical inspection. Because maybe you don't want to pull it all apart first if you can just leave it together and check the wires. So, so if you pull the sensor out and it's all oil and got metal on it, you know, it's that's no bad. brain you got to do a, yep. do a seal there. Because you got two two things going on. You've got the oil film, which is going to cause a transmission, signal transmission issue. And also that oil will eventually, it's a solvent, so it'll soak into the sensor and cause an issue with the sensor picking up the what's going on. Hey, Tariel, you, you've called okay. in before, and we appreciate it. Are you the local mechanic mm-hmm. that gets to fix everybody's car in the neighborhood, or, or, or are you a fixer by, by a trade? Or We appreciate the calls. You've always got good stuff. What's, going, what, what's, your, what's your story down there? Oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a mechanic. You know, I just uh, get a lot of jobs. You know, if I'm not familiar with it, you know, I kind of uh, get all the information I can. You know? well, we appreciate it. I'm glad, we're listening. I'm glad you're a hoodie and listen to the show. You're, Have you, we got you a hoodie yet? Oh, yeah, yeah, I got one. Appreciate that. All, All right. right. Very All right, good. good. Very good. Well, thank you very much. I like I Here's what I like. He calls back with another, with you know, with different problems. So that yep. means we must have helped him at some point in the past. I don't want to call these guys. Yeah, you got to be at least 50-50. Yeah. At least, yeah. <laughs> They're not even 50-50. Thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Rick. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Rick, what can we do for you? Hey, man, really appreciate the show. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, my son had a 02 F-250 diesel pickup that just burst into flames middle of the night. He woke up to a bonfire outside of his house. I wonder if you've uh, heard of that sort of thing happen. What yes. What might be the cause? We have. Um, and it's not overly frequent but they're not just for electric cars anymore no there there is a era of fords and i don't know if this falls into that box or not that had a problem with the oh my gosh cruise control wasn't it the cruise control regulator yeah the cutoff switch they put a fuse in it and a new switch to regulate that problem it happened with cars trucks a lot of things i remember we fixed up a van for our good friends down at uh uh, winstar tony's catering in oh yeah that ford yeah that was one that had they had a, a very specialized catering van, and they got the fire stopped. Yeah, but, I remember the the 
insurance people came out and looked at it, and they said it was something. And I said, I think it was the brake switch thing. It was never, the recall was never done. They said, well, how can you tell everything's melted? I said, well, here, where there was two feet of wire connected to the brake switch that was all melted with the metal still there. I said, do you see the fuse that's supposed to be put in here for the jumper harness? Oh, good point. <laughs> yeah, so you might check on that. There was a there was quite a bit of buzz about that. Um, I have to say, I just I googled it while you were talking, and Rick. First of all, we, you want to point out that I have access to a computer, and you guys don't. You do use your phone often for texting. Yeah, it's usually my wife telling me what we're doing wrong. Right, absolutely. Sometimes the listeners will say, you answered that question way too quick to have a computer. Yeah, <laughs> but I just Googled it, Rick, and there are so many responses and so many news stories about it that I can't even track it down enough to give you any sort of an answer. So I, wh- right. what, do, what do you do? Do you go to the deal? Do you, what well, do you at do? this point, it's not is, dealer. is there insurance involved? They, know, they notified everybody. Is, is there insurance involved? Nothing that's going to help. Well, <laughs> that's a good point, but here's what will usually happen. The typical is if there is a fire like that and the insurance company's involved, typically they're going to take care of their, their claimant um, that has the claim. And they're usually it, hip to what's going on. Yeah, and the, well, and then once it gets into their system, they've got a pretty big database that says, okay, this is your vehicle, this is going on. Oh, yeah, we got this going on. We need to call Bob at... XYZ law firm or mm-hmm. whoever they're going to subrogate against if there's a, a pending liability yet from whatever actions had been taken before. Now, in many cases, what will happen is that they'll say, well, this thing was a problem. And they'll say, yeah, and we sent you 77 recall letters and you right. never answered any of them. So you're on your own because mm-hmm. um, we did what we were supposed to do. That's right. why we are starting to see more of the manufacturers. It, it goes in streaks, it seems like, and I think it has to do with the temperature of litigation and the cost of what the, the claim is. But we'll see different manufacturers, and I've mentioned this before, being an automotive dismantler and having a, a large quantity of vehicles that we buy, and some of them end up being in our name just by the way the process goes as a dealer. We will get contacted a lot for recalls, warranty claims, and we do get to see a lot of the different methods. And sometimes it's a postcard, but we've got a lot of them where they've hired contractors now to make f- physical phone calls and make sure that they're getting a hold of people. And Another idea. What's Keep that? Going. No, we'll, no, we'll but they, they will do that. And, and so they're saying, hey, we've <laughs> kind of like the old joke. We sent a plane. I sent a boat. I sent a, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. but they'll send a postcard. They'll have somebody call. They'll have somebody. I don't know if they knock on your door or not, but we've actually had people from Honda Motor Company come to the salvage yard and want to find out if we have any of these, well, because they knew we had a certain Honda. And they want to look. They want to talk about the airbags for the Takata recall. And they were contractors that were basically, as we found out looking into it, they were bird dogs for Honda. And if they could take this list and find as many of these as they could, they would get a certain amount of remuneration for closing this claim up. Okay. For them to let them, or closing this record. Sure, sure. So that they knew that this car was either disposed of and destroyed and or, if not, they wanted to remedy it right. and take care of it and make sure it got on the list for remedy. Interesting. Yeah, so I don't know. We, we kind of left a long way from his 02 Ford with a fire. Well, yeah. but there, did, did it burn inside or outside? Was it in a, in a, a housing structure or a garage or a shed? It was parked outside the house. Oh, that's, okay. I mean, that's the saving it grace a little bit. Near, but, next, uh, he did have a nice suburban that was parked right next to him. That one was too. So he lost two vehicles. Hmm. Yeah, that's too bad. And, and we don't know for sure that's what it was, right. but it is definitely a likely culprit in that era. I think that falls in that era, if I remember right. And if, if from what I Googled, it, it certainly is talked about. There is, But do you think, and this is pure conjecture, are they less likely to do anything with the truck burned, not in probably just liability insurance? The truck is gone and no one was hurt, and if... You're not going to file a lawsuit. They're going to just go, huh, so, sorry, we sent out 77 notices. But if it were discovered while it was still an issue, if he heard that this happened or someone listening now goes and finds out their car's in it, are they more likely to get the remedy than he's likely to get remuneration for his burnt-up truck? I, I think he could be in a tough spot because as long as it's been and as it's, much new, right. noise as there was about it's it. It's been more than a decade since yeah, it started. so that's... Yeah. That, and that's always the case, too. It happens a lot. But it, I would definitely be asking the questions. 
And fair enough to for, I mean, like you said, if if it was a, an issue, they sent out the notices, and if it, this truck no. didn't make it and through that. How many how times you? have you come into our shop, Chris, and we do an oil change and say, hey, oh, yeah. you know, you still got a recall on that vehicle. I know, I know. Yeah. Okay. And, hey, Chris, you still got a recall. Ah, stop bothering me. I know. Hey, yeah. you, Chris, you still have a recall. So every time you go into a professional service center, it's going to pop up on right. the recall list. So it's it's there. Is that they're just at some point. But now let's say we go all the way back. We had on this show, I can remember vividly, when you owned a Windstar, mm-hmm. and we did a story about a Massachusetts man in his 20s that was killed when his Windstar broke an axle and rolled over and killed him. You remember that? Mm-hmm. He, his family got the recall notice in the mail a few weeks after the injury. Mm-hmm. I'm guessing there was probably some money there if right. there hadn't been any previous notifications sent out. So sometimes they just realize, well, oh, we have a problem. Well, and I think, too, Russ, in that case, out. too, they had – maybe you're saying, I'm saying the same thing, but they knew – they had to do this, mm-hmm. but the machine had not gotten oiled enough to get right. the notices sent out. Yep. They had already declared they had a problem, but they had notified no one yet. So mm-hmm. first it was on Ford, and then it was on the, the other people, and that happens yeah. with every company. So when I go into Home Depot, Menards, Kohl's, right when you walk in, there's usually a big board on the wall, that even the grocery store, that a lot of people don't pay attention to. But I was standing by one the other day waiting for my wife, and I just happened to look at it and went, Look at all these recalls. Do you own this pressure washer? Do you own this ceramic heater? It's got a recall notice. Mm-hmm. You're supposed to bring it in. I don't look at that, and I probably own and you didn't something send in over the, the card. Years. No, when you, you didn't it. register it. Yeah. Who registers these things? Not very many people. They don't want all that. I like spam. new ones that have a QR code. You can just scan, and mm-hmm. it kind of takes you there. But then it seems like you're signing up for when something. You get more emails. Than don't want to yeah. put the name in. Yeah. yeah. Rick, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. We're going to take a break when and we come af- back. After the break, I want to. Just mention a story about another fire. Okay. We'll do it after the break. 866-594-4150. That's what we call a tease, Shannon. Well done.
Find out how you can participate in the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. 866-594-4150. That's the number to reach us here at the Under the Hood Show. If you follow us on Facebook and, hmm, let's say if you comment in the next four weeks on one of our live shows that you want a hoodie and you join the hoodie fan club at underthehoodshow.com, you'll be eligible to win a hoodie. Let's pick a winner off Facebook in the next, before Christmas, we'll pick a winner who oh. comments on a live show off of Facebook. There, that's a good one. But who wins this this hour? Jeff Warren. Congratulations, Jeff. From our friends over at Universal Technical Institute, uti.edu. We're going to get them on the air and mm-hmm. talk about some really cool stuff they're doing with their schools and just give you more information about who they are and what they do and, and help you out with your career in automotive and machine work. I want to talk CNC to them about stuff. electric cars and what they've got going with We've that because they're also, they've got, you've got to do both now if you're going in, right? Don't oh, you kind of? Yeah, it's up to you. Yeah. But yes, you can get into all that stuff. But I was, I was out, you know, couldn't, couldn't make it that day. It's kind of a rare thing that it was just like, we were going to have this scheduled and wasn't planned, just wasn't here. So thanks for your cards and letters. <laughs> all right. We're going to talk to you in a minute, Bill. You're, you have a quick story. Well, when the, when the caller called in, Rick had the fire on his Ford diesel. It just, and he said it was next to a Suburban that burned also. It made me think of the recent news that was just around Thanksgiving time. And there was plenty of conspiracy theories. And I think that uh, I'm sure the, the, the truth will come out in some form eventually. Maybe it has already. But there were five or six vehicles that had been rented by the president's Secret Service detail. When he was at his, uh, just his little island of Nantucket that he hangs out on, mm-hmm. and at the Nantucket airport, and at like 5.30 in the morning after they had returned these vehicles, first I was kind of surprised that they rent from Hertz. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Of, do they call up and say, yeah, we're coming into town, and we need, yeah, it makes sense. It's what they do. Do they, they get priority? It's not the. <laughs> That's it, why I didn't get my Suburban. It's their five. I mean, it's not, it's people moving. It's yeah. not the president. Right. Yeah. It's them but going, the hey, we got to get. Secret Service, I mean, they they're the guys that'll take a bullet for the president. I think you'd just have some pretty good detail for that whole deal. Yeah, I think you're bringing in a hundred guys to do stuff, and when you land on the plane, you gotta get vehicles. So, so they anyway, after they had returned these vehicles at the Nantucket airport, so we're talking five something in the morning. One of the airport officials noticed a fire coming from that area, and it burned up five or six vehicles. Um, like I said, my mom had seen this story, and the, by the time she had saw it. They were all EVs and all this stuff, mm-hmm. and it, it wasn't. It sounds like it might have been an expedition that started the fire from a couple of things I've been reading, and then it spread to the other ones, and it, they showed pictures of the charred remains, and it ended up burning like 40 feet away from their jet fuel tanks. I'm looking at that. Uh, hey, we're short on cars, but we got an O2 expedition diesel you could, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, pretty devastating little fire, and, and that's not a big airport. I mean, that's not a big island. I had an opportunity to talk with a, a lady that was at one of the conferences we're at, and, and her and her husband are, are near that area, and they talked about just how difficult that island has gotten to be part of or be around just because of the exclusivity of it mm-hmm. and how difficult it is for them to have housing and available areas for the people that need to do the work on the island for all the people that are there. Right. And so they've made... A lot of com- communities have made this. They've made rules. They said that they have to, if you're going to buy housing or do something, that you have to also have a quarters or an area for, for a policeman sure. or a fireman or one of those things. Um, and that was something that, uh, you know, just once they tell you those stories, you can't get them out of your head. Uh, just, so, I'm reading a few things about it. There's five of them that burned, and they think the reports right now are that the one that started – was under a park outside recall notice. Oh. So, <laughs> so and, and that's something that there's a lot of debate around the country as regards to the, uh, as to as far as those cars should be right. s- sold, uh-huh. used. Most of the time they should be parked up. They should be set aside. Right. Until fixed. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, that, that yeah, made me think of that yeah. when, when he told me about Burning next to a Suburban, I realized I mm-hmm. never talked about that story on the air. It was a, a recent happening. All right, let's go to Idaho and talk to Bill. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Bill, what can we do for you? Good morning, gentlemen. Morning. So, 
I've got a question about uh, one vehicle in particular. I'm looking at a couple of used vehicles in my area. The only thing similar about them is the price. But, uh, one of them is a 03 Ford Expedition, but it has the 5.4 V8, which I've been avoiding. So what can you tell me about the 2003 model? Is that safe to buy or is that the bad one? You made a you made an audible noise there, Russ, when he said he oh, has questions about the 5.0. Yeah, 03 still has, I think, the old generation engine in it, doesn't it, Russ? Yeah, it should. Because um, I think the 04 Ford is when they came out with the three-valve engine with the more frequently and commonly failed cam phaser issues yeah. because of oil pressure. And I don't think the Expedition got that until they upgraded it in 05, if I, if I remember right. Right. And, you know, even if you did, even if you wanted to go out and purchase an 04 or 05 or 06 or 07 Expedition with a 5.4, I would feel comfortable in doing so knowing that if it's working good when you get it, and you catch it early enough, like when it first starts making a little bit of tick and you get in the noise, you get the cam phaser lockout kit installed, which they now sell that is 50 state emissions legal, so shops should be comfortable putting them in, and you can repair the issue. You wait too long, it may need an engine, and then there's the rare case where it's going to need an engine for something else. But as far as what we used to see that was a non-repairable issue, going back a few years where you needed an engine every time, that's been taken care of a lot. But I think with an 03, I'd feel more comfortable with an 03 than an 04. Just make sure that we're right. If Now, let me get – I'm going to go with what Russ is saying. Even if it has the new engine. Exactly. But the 02, if it was the older – or the 03, if it is the older generation, it would not be a three-valve engine. It would be mm-hmm. just a typical one intake valve, one exhaust valve. Um, it's just a more simple engine with less going on on the top end of the engine. It's still the same modular 5.4, right. and, and they've been using that engine since 1997 mm-hmm. in a pickup and in an ex- expeditions and stuff. So it's not there's – a, there's a fleet Super of those tough engines. Super before yeah, they Yeah, there's a fleet of those phaser. engines that we very seldom sell uh, in comparison. Now, we say it all the time, the 5.4.3 valve was a big problem, but guess what? We've talked a lot on the show about the 07 up Silverados with the five threes and the active fuel management problems and and the the, the top end problems and and you know rocker paint problems. I mean, we saw and the the Hemi's with the the valve seats coming out when they get too many miles on them and and throwing shrapnel in the engine. I mean, the only one we don't talk about as much is the Toyota Tundra, to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, those three, there's a lot of them made. There's mm-hmm. a lot of them on the road. A lot. So. You really just got to make sure that state of health is good when you're looking at it. Was there another vehicle you yeah, had on your list? Quiet. I do. It's actually a uh, 94 GMC Sierra uh, with 150,000 miles, which is the reason I'm looking at it. Uh, so it's not apples to apples, but it's, uh, you know, like I say, the same price. I, I think either one of those vehicles is going to be pretty solid. That throttle body 350. They, we, a matter of fact, I was just taking a picture of one this morning. We got in, in a, we got like a 92 two door blazer in. We don't see those very often. And, but they used that engine from 1987 to 1995, that, that throttle body 350. And they used it in Suburbans. They used it in Tahoes. They used it in pickups. They used it in cop cars, Caprices. Um, they put it in Buick Roadmasters. They put it in, All kinds of stuff, and that was a pretty darn solid engine. But guess what? They do go bad, too, if they're not maintained well. But it's it's a pretty solid engine. I think both of those, if they're running good, they're quiet upon startup, um, they got a good maintenance history. And on the board, you might be able to track, find out if it was. We talk about that often, the, the... the, the record exchanges with all these databases with like things like Carfax and stuff, you can learn a lot about the maintenance history of a vehicle. Not all of them. Just some are in private fleets, and that just doesn't ever hit the radar. But you just got to look for something that you know the, that has been maintained. And sometimes when you get to a certain price point, it is up to you mm-hmm. and your ear and your eyeballs yeah. and just some good old-fashioned inspection just to, to get a good hunch of what you're going to get. Bill, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. Let us know. If you picked one and how it went, 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Craig in Nebraska. You're on the end of the hood show. What can we do for you, Craig? Hi, guys. Uh, I called about four weeks ago. 
Um, I had a 2000 Cadillac DeVille that had a high battery drain on it. It would drain the battery in about four hours. Yeah. And, we and uh, Russ thought it was, yeah, Russ thought it was probably a short in the alternator. Mm-hmm. And uh, just to kind of confirm my suspicions, I had a analog voltage meter I hooked up to the battery while it was running. Uh, it would charge the battery, but uh, it had a high fluctuation on the uh, uh, output. It would go anywhere from about 12.2 volts all the way up to 14.5 and, and back down again. And so I changed the alternator out, and that took care of the problem. So I just wanted to call you guys and let you know that was the problem. Well, it's nice to get a win. Yeah, we like those calls. Thanks yeah. very much, Greg. That's awesome. But I, and it was just to kind of recap on that, too, I remember Russ mentioned it on some of those Fire. vehicles is that if you know that you're having that draw and if it's a cool day and that vehicle's been sitting for overnight and uh, the alternator's still got a, a little bit of warmth to it on some of these, that the regulator might be stuck or it might be still engaging, and, and that's just pulling that battery down. That's the thing that's going to be – a heavy enough draw to pull that thing down that fast. And the fire we talked about on the expedition is a very low amp battery volt, like a 14-gauge wire, 16-gauge wire. This is like a 4-gauge wire or 2-gauge wire from that alternator and a dead short it can be so that we're talking about a much greater risk of fire. Craig, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Out of the Hood Show. Make a radio appointment each week to hear the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show. 866-594-4150. That's the number to reach us. Let's go to Illinois and talk to Carlo. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Carlo, what can we do for you? Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for taking, taking my call. Um, just to let you guys know, I am a uh, UTI graduate. Uh, All right. Post-six. Yeah, um, I've since moved on from the automotive field. I did go into uh, 
the uh, car audio side. But okay. uh, I am working on a uh, 2008 Lexus SC430. Um, it's my, you know, my toy car. I replaced the radio. I did, I did all my uh, fiberglass work for a new radio. Did all my uh, wiring, but for some odd reason, anytime I go into AM or FM, I'm getting a lot of static. But if I hold my hand <laughs> out of the car with the antenna, no static at all. I mean, I could put up a 20-foot antenna, and if it's within the confines of the car, it's static. But if it's four feet away from the car, no static. I was wondering what you think is going on there. Well, you need a you need an antenna with a good ground plane to the car in order to eliminate that. I've I've worked on many of an antenna problem over the years, both in car audio and out of car audio shops, and uh, most of the time it, it comes down to the there's either something wrong with the antenna itself, right at the base of it, because the metal part's usually fine. And if it's in a windshield antenna, if it's got a good connection there, it's usually somewhere along the cable. Either it's gotten moisture in it, being where it runs under the carpet, or if it runs behind a dash, it's just corroded at a joint somewhere. And typically, if it's got a fender-mounted antenna, when we replace the whole assembly with the cable and the antenna and everything, it's pretty much always fixed the problem. The fact that he can move it and get it to go away... That leads you in that direction, right? Yeah, and what's happened is if you're in the car, you you don't have a good ground to the car to disperse any kind of uh, EM radiation you've got going on in the car. You know, there's there's static that's that's going to be in there picked up from all the electronics and you know spark plugs and wires and coils and all the computers, all that stuff is going to do the other audio equipment. But to get that in, you're you're probably going to have to replace. You're going to have to look and see where the Antenna connects. If I remember it, that one's in the rear glass, isn't it, on that car? Uh, it's actually fender mounted in the back. It's an automatic. Okay. Um, if you've got a f- if you've got a fender mounted automatic rear antenna, those are really bad about connections inside because they don't make a good solid connection until the antenna is all the way up and that bottom piece is seated where it's got a little okay. copper piece in it. So you might the cheapest way is going to be able to to get the the cheapest bolt-on, fender-mounted antenna you can get. In, in, I mean, you can replace the whole electric motor. You can buy an, an aftermarket off of Amazon, and they're pretty good. They're probably about 35 to 60 bucks for one of those. But if you get just a cheap fender-mounted antenna with a long cable on it, bolt it in back there temporarily and run the cable through the back seat and plug it into the radio, see if your problem goes away. I bet it will. But that yeah. rear-mounted... Um- I think it's got a junction, too, under the back seat area between the – so you've got about a six-foot cable on the antenna and then another lead that goes from there up front, and that could be bad. Okay, I actually have done that. Um, my next step was actually going to do a big three upgrade with my, you know, with my uh, body ground, engine ground, and mm-hmm. the cable from the uh, alternator to the battery. Um, so I guess, uh, I guess I can – try doing a, a big three upgrade give it a shot and see what happens especially if it's more noise with the engine running than off oh it's it's a, a whole bunch of noise when the engine is on yeah it's, it's bad. well i worked on that for years you know working in car audio just to, to try to get the noise out and a lot of people didn't care turn the radio up louder we don't care about the noise but when we go to contest a lot of it was <laughs> start the car yep is there any audible noise if there is points off you know and we wanted it loud and we wanted it clean Clean, yeah oh now now i try to i want my hearing so i don't want any i'm i'm done with the super loud i still play mine louder than i should but you know i I, yeah (laughs) now i'm looking at chris you turn my my, yeah my my microphone volume up (laughs) my my earphone volume up Uh (laughs) wonder why carlo thanks very much for the call good luck 866-594-4150 Five oh. Let's go back to Oklahoma and talk to Mason. You're on the end of the hood show. Mason, what can we do for you? Well, I've got a nineteen ninety nine Ford Explorer that I bought for like the family car. Um, I'm an old Fox body guy back in the day. And so I'm real familiar with the five motor. And so I thought that'd be a great platform to go ahead and get. 
and it's been a great uh, truck. I've got a really good deal on it with really low miles, and uh, um, had to put a fuel pump in it. That's why I got such a great deal on it, and drove great for about two years. And I started having this weird uh, warm start issue. I kind of describe the truck as like a horror uh, movie kind of vehicle where, you know, you're like, why would you have a vehicle that takes two or three times to start, and then it fires up every time? But that's kind of what it does. And um, the the issue with it, I, I've been trying to track it down as if it's a vacuum. And I'm going down the line. I thought maybe it's a throttle body issue. Um, but what it's doing is it, uh, it fires up after you try to go about two or three attempts at the ignition of starting. And it fires up every time, like two or three times after you've driven it about 20 or 30 minutes. But the first time initially every day, it fires right off, no problem. Drive it for 10, 20 minutes, you're going to have to like kind of attempt to start it a couple times. Um I've gone through a list of uh, trying to replace it, replace parts. Um, I, I went to the EGR valve and replaced it twice, thinking maybe I just got a bad one. And, again, on the throttle body, I, I replaced the TPS sensor and the idle control valve on it. And um, I had to replace the PCV, uh, 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 PCV valve, I mean, and I uh, took off the top of the intake and replaced that top intake gasket. But I have yet to be able to figure out what's going on and what what seems to happen now is on a really 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 hot day, and let's say 97, 97 plus temperature outside uh, their temperature, the truck has a hard time um, sitting in a light. It, it wants to stumble. So as soon as you take off and compression takes over, runs smooth and has plenty of power. And so I'm kind of at a loss of what I'm going to have to do next. What about the fuel pressure regulator? Have you replaced that? I have not. I have not done that. I I, um, I just replaced the whole fuel pump when I first got it, okay. and checked uh, you know and checked into the, uh, the fuel filter on it down the line, and seemed like it, it ran so great. Um, and like I said again, the initial startup, awesome. But once uh, once it warms up, it's uh, it seems to be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm yeah. kind of I think I'm gonna take it to a shop and have them do a smoke test on it. You know, yeah. to see if I've got another vacuum leak. Because whenever whenever you go to start it, it does fire off. It smells extremely rich. Yeah, it um, sounds like just, your fuel pressure regulator's bad. It's on the engine, and when it's hot, okay. it's going to dump fuel in there. It's going to leak, and it's going to cause that. The hotter it is, the more pressure in the tank, the worse it would be. But when it's cold, it's like a choke. It gives you a little, like starting fluid, gives you a little extra go, and then it fires right up instantly when it's cold, and you would have that fuel smell, and that'll be on the fuel rail right on the engine. And if you run this thing till it's warm, shut it off and wait about five minutes, and then just pull that vacuum hose off of this little thing. It's about the size of a golf ball there on the on the rail. Pull it off, and if it's wet in that fuel in that line, it's bad. Just get another one, replace it, put it back together, and see what she does. Because there should be zero I gas in that line. Um, yeah, what I, I'll tell you one other thing that I, I have been uh, – I only have one check engine light, and that's why I started going down the line with the vacuum aspect on the EGR valve. But it's saying that my number two cylinder is lean, that I'm running I'm running lean, and, uh, you know, one, uh, you know, one of the little service shops, uh, their check engine uh, diagnostic machine says EGR valve. The other one says intake gasket. And it seems to be a common problem, so that's why I kind of went down the line trying to replace that. And I'm, I'm not looking forward to having to do the bottom intake gasket because it's kind of, uh, kind of more of an ordeal um, yep. that I wanted to get into at the, at the house. Maybe the top intake gasket was pretty, um, pretty time-consuming itself. But um, the bottom one, I've got to, uh, it looks like I've got to take the, fuel um, rail off and for some reason Ford decided to run these hard lines for the uh, core uh, for the heater core for the return lines well the, you sound like you're very knowledgeable on this and you've got yourself going the right direction I think but so, yeah. please take the time though to um, you know do some te- more testing on look it. at that regulator before yes, you before spend you go any all further the money in the because shop. those codes can just like your shops are telling you they'll take people different directions because uh, it's a result not a cause right and so you got to you got to find the cause, and it could be triggering some different results that might bring you the wrong direction pretty quick. Mason, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. we got about a minute. Jeremy, you had a follow-up on the audio? Was that guy that just called, was he talking about a Fox body? No, he's talking about a Lexus. Yeah, he had a Lexus yeah. 430. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. The, you yeah. conflated the two calls I, there, which yeah, I do this, all the this time. This one was the yeah. last one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I totally do I'm all the time. Conflator. Did, did you have any advice um, for his Lexus, Jeremy? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm a Fox body guy. So okay. I own my car for like three three decades now, and I thought it was a speed density 
So I was going to tell him the ignition module on the distributor cap. Uh-huh. I had the oh, yeah, but okay. The gentleman before he did have a he was a Fox Body guy, and he bought an Explorer because it had mm-hmm. a five liter in it. Right. So, so you are Jermaine. Yeah, you were on the right. You just had the audio problem on yes. the wrong vehicle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks very much for the call, Jeremy. 866-594-4150. I have a quick idea. I remember I had my idea a long time ago to hire or get an internship for a college person who wants to do, like, MIS, and they could create a database of our calls. Yep. What if we had somebody do a project where they did a database of all of the recalls that you get because you have so many cars that have come through your inventory? And we could see on a spreadsheet what cars are being recalled and how many you've gotten and what were the... I think the government already does that. It's called, sure. called, it's called recalls.gov, and I think they've changed <laughs> it to something else now. Good point. I think, and my mom does it. <laughs> That's a good point. That'll do it for this hour of the Under the Hood Show. Hour 2 is coming up.
You're listening to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show with the Motor Medics, Shannon Nordstrom and Russ the Super Tech Evans. Shannon is an ASE engine and parts specialist, and Russ is an ASE master certified technician with extensive factory drivability training. Join the Motor Medics for fun and free automotive advice with real world solutions to everyday automotive problems. The Under the Hood Show is heard weekly on this and other great radio stations across the U.S. Find out how you can participate in the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. With Russ Evans, this is Shannon Nordstrom thanking you for tuning in to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show. Have a great day, and remember, PTLA. The opinions heard on this program, based on the many years of experience of Russ and Shannon, are offered for entertainment value only and as a guide to your repair needs. No claim to repair or cause is given or implied. Always consult with your own certified technician and follow all safety procedures before attempting any repair. To be a part of the show, call 866-594-4150. Under the Hood is produced by Prairie House Productions. All content is the property of Nordstrom's Automotive Incorporated and may not be used without our permission. Copyright Nordstrom's Automotive Inc. Now, let's go Under the Hood with the Nordstrom's Motor Medics. Welcome to the Under the Hood Show, brought to you by Sturdivants. Russ Evans is here to answer your automotive questions. Welcome to Under the Hood. Thanks for joining us. Shannon Nordstrom is here to do the same. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. I'm Chris Carter here to answer your calls at 866-594-4150. 866-594-4150. Rick, uh, he, he sent us, he called us a while ago. He's been on hold for quite a while, so I want to get right to him, and we'll get going into this hour of the Under the Hood show. Rick, you're on the Under the Hood show. What can we do for you? Hi there. So I've got a, a 2019 Ford F-150 pickup that came from Canada, and I'm having a little bit of a, uh, I guess, more or less question about the gauge cluster. So the gauge cluster that, when they converted it to U.S., um, the they ended up putting a six-speed uh, gauge cluster in, even though it's got a 10-speed, uh, because there was an issue with the 10 speed when they initially uh, converted it, and now I'm being told that there's no way to put a 10-speed gauge cluster back in it, and I'm just double-checking that that's proof that you cannot put a 10-speed gauge cluster uh, for the U.S. in a Canadian-built pickup. We have had a question very similar to this before. Uh, I'm I'm pondering what's going on here. I I guess most of the Canadian vehicles that I end up getting in my possession – Nobody bothers to convert anything. Mm-hmm. They, they, I've had a case where vehicles went into Canada, and they've had to add, back lights. in the day, daytime running lights or certain taillights or whatever it might happen to be. But I guess I've never heard of anyone saying that they think they have to convert something coming into you the just States. just push the button on the dash, and it, it switches from kilometers to miles. Typically, that's what happens. So I'm, I'm a little confused why they were switching it. Um, well, when I first got it, um, when they, when I would drive, uh, as you the um, analog gauge uh, for the miles per hour um, um, would bury it over to 120 miles per hour as you would drive. So they figured that there was a problem with it, so they put in a new gauge cluster, and the new 10-speed gauge cluster did the same thing. So they ended up putting in a six-speed, and it works fine with that and so they were going to order a new 10 speed and uh, Ford's res- the Ford dealership told me that there's no way to put in a 10 speed one because they don't um, they, they can't legally do that I want to know why if they it first thing I'd so I'd start researching this yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what are we missing here Russ look at a 19 truck an f-150 does it have a 10 speed United States cluster in it. Okay, if it does, and the Canada makes one, why can't it be put in? I, I need to know that for a fact. But if we see that the 19s in the United States look different, they're like a six-speed cluster, than what's in Canada, they may be building something different in the United Spec States. differently for the United States. So you wouldn't be able to operate it that way. I would have to see that all other trucks, but if I see that all other trucks in the United States that are 19, and we haven't looked at this because we haven't had this issue yet, so we had no reason to. I've had 19s in the shop. I just never paid attention to that. So if I see that everyone else here is equipped with that, 
I wonder why. Because they, when they build these for different countries, they put different software in them and sometimes different pretty pictures on indicators that are more friendly to the region they're in. The radio might have, um, you know, different printing on the front of it, even though it's basically the same radio, just different printing. Uh, sometimes the fuel gauge will have a different picture for fuel and the arrow that says left tank or, you know, right side tank, depending on the, those things change because that's what they're used to in their culture of where they grow up. They have different, you know, symbols printed sure. on there. But as far as the units themselves, I have not seen one that I can ever remember working on both Canadian and United States vehicles that had a different physical yeah, connection. It sure seems like nowadays you just flip it over from metric to English. That's yeah, and, and with the – so your speedometer, your mechanical speedometer, when you're driving, on the bottom of it, does it say MPH on the bottom that's a light that lights up and you can push your KPH button and switch it from kilometers to miles? You can do that for the digital one um, that's in the center uh, in right. the um, PSP screen. Um, but on the analog side, mine looks just like a regular uh, U.S. one where you've got the kilometers is the smaller digits in the okay. center, and then the MPH ones are the bigger ones on the outside. See, a lot of vehicles, they just print one set of numbers, you know, 0 to 140, whatever it is, 120, 140, and then – they have a light at the bottom that glows, and if you set it for KPH or MPH, it just changes the calibration in the in the needle, but the numbers are still the same. But if you have the one that's actually printed with both sets of numbers on there, then yes. Okay. Then, he, then he needs to slow down. Maybe. Yeah. Okay, I see what you're saying. Or, or learn the metric system like we all were taught right back <laughs> well, we're in gonna, yeah. kindergarten, and they said, we're going to switch. Got to learn it. You got to go 88 when it's 55. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Isn't that right? Yeah, I think you can and, also, and if you, I remember if, them teaching us that. You if know? you actually owned a DeLorean, you know that when Doc said when this baby hits eighty-eight miles, he meant kilometers per hour because they barely will go over fifty-five. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why it didn't happen so much. People didn't travel in time. So do you? Okay, just to put a bow on this, so I don't think we're helping you a ton. No. But what do you I know? Did, did they make to. the same transmission spec and engine spec available in the United States as they did in Canada? Yeah, they're identical. If they're identical and you see other trucks with the same cluster, I'm crying foul. Is there I, 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 I had a conversation just yesterday with a with a repair shop, and we're talking about some custom wheels for our Bronco, which is supposed to be in transportation. Sure. Sure. Is. I, hey, the yeah. Ford dealer showed me, like, Rudolph on the map where they're tracking it. They track the vehicles now. It's moving. Okay. Congratulations it's, if it does show up. Yeah. So we're getting, well, there's going to be a rail strike now. It's on a train. Right. So that'll or a rail that, crash. That's that'll something's going to happen. But anyway, we were talking about tire size and calibration, and he made a comment that on the Fords that they work on, the pickups, they're able to calibrate up to a 37 inch tire with the factory software because it's available that way in the Raptor, okay. and because Ford engineered it for the Raptor, that architecture is in the computer that they can program it in a. A, a model below the Raptor. Okay. And he was wondering the same thing on this Bronco because we we're talking about tire calibration. If when the new Bronco Raptor comes out, it, since that's a 23 model that, and mine is going to be a 23 model now too, if maybe that calibration might be in there because of the introduction of the Raptor, uh, they, they, that they so might have it available. Get bigger tires. So, so that I could do the calibration with a factory tool versus okay. having to get some sort of aftermarket tool that sounds like it doesn't exist yet. Okay. Um, so. Those are the types of questions you start asking. Is this a really fancy truck or kind of a base model truck? It's an it's an XLT. It's nothing super fancy. Yeah, I I can't believe it can't be done. But there, there again, we're not. Don't say those guys in the radio shit said for sure. But it just it's very hard to believe that. that I wonder cross. if with the rules and regulations the way they are from Canada here, as far as like you guys said, lights all the things, all, all the things that they do that we don't. Is there some sort of technicality? Well, in when the they rules? say they can't put a ten speed in because it's not legal, that makes me lean towards they don't put that same cluster in other trucks in the United States. So I'd have to look and see what another one has in it. And my question is, is it a thing where you can't go changing the architecture of the truck for some other reason and this falls under that rule or regulation? Quick question, Russ. With our online connection to Ford. And you had to program to put that cluster in a vehicle as a, as a new cluster. Can you do that? Yeah. 
be interesting. I mean, I can I could put the physically put one in and try to program it and see what it does. It'd be interesting. Yeah. Rick, thanks very much for the call. Sorry we didn't answer your question completely, but sure made us think. You've intrigued us. Yeah. 866-594-4150. We're going to take a break and we come back, we want to hear from you. car feeling ill don't want to spread it to your wallet call the motor medics now for free advice 866-594-4150 that's the number to reach us here at the under the hood show let's talk to robert robert you're on the under the hood show what can we do for you good morning uh, i have a 2018 gmc sierra hd and um the problem I'm having is every time I start the truck, I drive it a block and a coolant, low coolant light comes on. I just, you know, hit the steering wheel and dismiss that message. I pull the truck over, check the reservoir, it's full as it can be, and uh, it, it won't come back on as long as I drive the truck and don't shut it off. The minute I shut the truck off, the next time I start the truck, that low coolant light comes on again. It only comes on once I've shut the truck off and started it up again. Got any idea? There is a sensor in the coolant reservoir up there that tells you when it's yep. low. I think that sensor has failed. I, I've, I've put a lot of them in. Yep. The, the, we replaced the whole, the whole Jug. thing. Right. Our partner over at DormanProducts.com sells a lot of this kind of stuff if it's Failing often, and it's something that a lot of people can do on their own DIY stuff. They typically make it for almost everything. Sophisticated electronics. So you just buy the tank, you stick it on there, you fill it up, you plug it in. What happens if it ever gets low, even sometimes during a coolant flush, it'll just oxidize the sensor a tiny bit, or even if it hasn't been low, and it, it measures by resistance. And if it gets a little covered up, it just doesn't work, and there's no way to clean it. You wouldn't be able to reach it to clean it where it's located, and it's typically molded right in when the thing's new and you can't get it out. They don't want it to leak, so they just stick it in there while it's hot, and it's done. It's sealed in there permanently. But they're not very expensive in most cases. I don't know what this one costs. I haven't purchased one, but 
Uh, we'll see them from 25 bucks to 95 bucks in most cases for a cool, complete coolant reservoir. So is what's happening here, Russ, is when this vehicle starts up, it's going through its self-check and it's saying... Sees it's failed, hit the button, clear it. But it's not such a thing that it's going to stay on for like a check engine light. It's just saying that, okay, this isn't working and it's going to tell me every time we start it up. Apparently, they're okay with letting you run with low coolant. They'll let you dismiss it. Just like an airbag. Oh, clear it. It's fine. Unless, yeah, unless that... The low coolant light in maybe there's a set. It's saying if you look into the manual, it'll say if it's doing this, it means there's a problem. If it's doing this, it means there's a little flashing, like a check engine light versus a flashing check engine light. Maybe. Well, it, first indication is low coolant, and then if it gives you hot engine, it may come back on and say low coolant, hot engine. Right. Problem is with low coolant, until the advent of cylinder head temperature sensors. An engine doesn't know when it's hot. I've had so many people come in and say, my car couldn't have overheated. It, it overheated. It's melted down. That's why your engine's bad. No, it never. the temperature gauge never went above half. I said, that's the same reason that if you take your thermometer and hold it over a boiling pot of water on the stove, does it read? Well, it may get warm, but not the actual temperature. You've got to have it oh, in man. the water. You pull it out of the water, it's not going to read. Right. Is a meat thermometer going to read if it's not stuck in the steak? You know, the ribeye, Ooh, bone yeah, I'm in. getting hungry. Yeah. Mm. No, you've got to put it in there to find out. So if it's not touching, but a cylinder head temperature sensor is just basically, you know, stuck to the outside of the hamburger, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. steak burger. Whatever. And then it reads it all the time. doesn't care what the internals are at. So okay. that's a good thing that they've switched to those. Robert, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. I like that we've talked to Dorman before on the show, and they've been a, a longtime sponsor and a longtime partner of you guys at the shop. I love the fact that they do stuff like they say, hey, uh, a lot of people are trying to get this part from Ford, and let's look at it. Oh, see, this has a, oh, I see what Ford did. They, they have this. Well, let me check. I think we could make that more sturdy, more affordably. Okay, yeah, let's offer this part. I think that's such a neat... Well, and they'll send out to shops. They've got a network of shops that they'll send out to and say, hey, are you seeing a fa- failure in this? Can you send us failed ones? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then, hey, we've got this. Do you want to try? we got a try-on going on here. Do you guys want to give this a shot and see what happens? If it's different, uh, give us some feedback. Uh, we're developing this. Like and- in the Trailblazer, they, they said, send us a bunch of them, and I, I can just imagine they got in a 1,000 of them from across the country, and they looked and said... Every one of these manifolds is broken right here in the middle. Why is that? So then they stick it in their oven, heat it up, and they see it expand, and they say, you know, (laughs) right here it's pushing it apart. What if we cut this webbing out between these two center cylinders and then just make each one of the pipes, you know, a two thousandths thicker? Let's try that. Then let's heat it up. And then they say, hey, it's not cracking. Then they send another email and say, try on notice from Dorman Products. And the shops or some shops get the lucky advantage of being able to try one for free. And they put it on, they run it for a year, report back to Dorman and say, no problems. Mm -hmm. Or we had a problem, Dorman modifies it, fixes it, and then it's out in the public. And they watch those things, and it's great. And then they sell a lot of stuff because of that. I I remember when we replaced my turbo Mm -hmm. with the Dorman, I was looking, I pulled the new one out, and I had the old one, and I was like, oh, yeah, look, they're different here. Oh, this part's thicker. On the new one, this yeah. part's thicker. Right, and on the old one, it was the crack. You could identify that? It was the Yeah, it was the cracked piece that looked different on the new one. <laughs> so I was like, well, that's a good idea. Apparently, that's a weak spot. Well, it might not be a weak spot normally, but for me, it was a weak well, spot. Well, it's amazing the number of parts that we go through that the part number from the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer, it stays the same mm-hmm. forever and ever and ever. You get the same one as the one that failed originally. So... It's got to hit somebody's radar to say, look at all these failures of this part. Mm-hmm. And the manufacturers, we got, always want to give them credit. There are times where they realize they have a problem, too, and they'll say, hey, no, this has been superseded with this part number. This is the one you got to put on now. Right. The other one's not available anymore. There may be some still out there on the shelves, but this is the, this is the one you want. It's got the thicker neck on it or the, the, big, you know, the watertight plug-in or whatever it might happen to be. 866-594-4150. We got a question from Facebook. Luke asks, I'm looking at a 2020 Nissan Titan. Anything I should look at? What do you hear about the 2020 Nissan Titans? Pretty good vehicle. And this Don't is, have a lot of 
big issues with them yet. Would this be in your, I mean, would a 2020 Nissan Titan be coming into you yet? Yeah. Oh, yeah. People okay. are bringing cars in when they're brand new for their first oil changes and anything that's not going to be paid for by the dealer. We had one, um, actually an employee, with the 5.6 V8 or that they've got in there. Is that right? That sounded wrong when I said it. But anyway, his was, a, I think, an 18, and it had a little bit of a misfire to it. And as they dug into it, they found out that he had a cylinder with a problem. And it was a thing, once okay. he got on the internet, that there was a number of them that had that. And his was a salvage title, so he couldn't get any warranty work done to it. Sure. And so we ended up replacing an engine in that vehicle um, because of a scored cylinder. I, I can't remember which one it was, but... Um, Make sure you got a good history. Make sure it's running good. But he absolutely loves that truck. Mm-hmm. I just loves that truck. But it was definitely a pretty low mileage incident that had nothing to do with the accident that it had. And as we looked into it, there was a number of them out there on the internet. People talking about having a a scored cylinder. I can't remember if it was an assembly issue or if it was a valve issue or or what it was. But there was that was the only thing that I've ever heard of in my orbit of things that come our direction that we okay. touch and see and hear and dismantle and sell that made me alert of that. Is there uh, otherwise, yeah, it's, it, I've heard good things about that. It's the, that's the not newest generation, right? But it's the. Yeah, it's, it, we've got a 19 uh, Titan right out front here okay. that we've been trying to sell as a repairable. It's a, it's one of the ones with the Cummins diesel in it, which they've quit making now in the newer models. And so, we're uh, we're pretty deep into that. If somebody wants a Cummins diesel Titan, we got a pretty nice one sitting here. Some people are, they love those things. It's I an mean, XD. It, it, it's what do you call it? When I say some people, there's like there's a following of a number of people who well, I know the okay. diesel really, shop. They got one sitting down there. They use all the time. Yeah, they love those things. So they're 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 great. So hey, I wanted to bring something up. Okay. I was talking to our partner over at Berkeley One Classics. Mm-hmm. Got a classic vehicle. We guessed the colors on some of the old classics and stuff as it comes through. They have just uh, done another, yet another expansion into Pennsylvania and Virginia. Okay. So if you've got the vehicles and those states and you're listening to us, now you've got an, a great opportunity to save a ton of money and get a lot better coverage than, yeah. than what you Pennsylvania have. Pennsylvania has one of the I'm biggest sorry. car events, the Hershey Car Show and... and uh, Flea market, and uh, they do. That's a yep. huge event every year out there. So I'm got sure some, that got some family out there that has, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of cars and mm-hmm. stuff out there. They should they should invite me out to to come to the show and hang out. Uh, yeah, that would be. I'll go. That's I mean, what they should do. I have. You need a chaperone. Come on, let's go. Kevin, we're going to talk to you next. We're going to take a break on the Under the Hood Show. 866-594-4150. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show.
Get your planner out right now and schedule your next radio appointment with the Motor Medics. 866-594-4150. That's the number to reach us. If you like or subscribe to our YouTube channel and join the Hoodie Fan Club at underthehoodshow.com, you could win a hoodie. Like Nicole Birch. Congratulations from our friends over at Universal Technical Institute. Mm -hmm. UTI.edu. Everything automotive under many roofs all across the That's true. country. You can find lots of campuses out there. In fact, with last earlier in the show, we talked to a graduate from UTI. So mm -hmm. Check them out. Everything automotive, and even aircraft now, airframe and power plant, mm -hmm. CNC, welding, marine mechanics. If you're thinking it's mechanical, check them out. Maybe they do it and you don't even know. I asked uh, the other, a recent show, I asked if you could be an A or a P, yeah. if you were an A and P. Did you find that one out? Yeah, uh, a listener messaged me and said, you can, you just don't. You just don't? Yeah. yeah you, you can, you just there don't. There are guys who specialize in one or the other. They're still but under they're, the, but they, they're, they're still under A and P, but they yeah. do one or the other, right? right? Yeah. 866-594-4150. Yeah. So. Let's go to Wisconsin and talk to Kevin. You're on the End of the Hood Show. Kevin, what can we do for you? Well, just a question regarding my 2015 Lincoln MKC. It's a 2.3 liter engine in there, and there's been a lot of problems. But ultimately, the most recent one is that there was a crack in the engine block between the two and three cylinders. Um, we ended up going with a rebuild through Ford and have that engine replaced. And we had the vehicle back in our possession, but we were getting lots of warning lights with regards to traction control and all sorts of um, codes that were coming up for like hill stop disabled and cruise control disabled and all sorts of stuff. We took it back. It wasn't a Ford shop, so they didn't have the Ford IDS tool, so they ended up trying to get a hold of one. And through lots of different uh, back and forth, they thought it was the connector to the alternator, but that wasn't it. They thought it was the wheel alignment, but that wasn't it. They most recently said now that this is all related to sensors on the steering uh, column, basically the rack and pinion. There's two sensors not communicating with each other. And I'm just thinking, have you heard of this before? Because why would this happen when just the engine block is being replaced? How is that even touched or, or is part of the issue? And they said, well, it's just coincidence. But maybe it got nicked when they took things apart. I don't know. No, they probably didn't touch anything. If it truly is a problem with a rack, what probably happened is that the battery was disconnected, which is, you have to do that. Yeah. Power's off. You turn it back on. Some things don't work. Just like the home computer. It worked the last time I used it. I think everybody's owned one at some point in their career. <laughs> they turn it off. They go turn it back on. It gives you the blue screen of death. Mm -hmm. You know, not found. Won't work. Like, well, what did we do to it? Well, I worked on it last time. What did I do? It just, it, I know it worked. All I did was turn it off back on. So when the system's powered down and it does a self check, it may not be able to self check because something failed while it had been operating for maybe even several years and it wasn't working. If you have sensors fail in power steering, especially the electric racks, they can give you ABS codes, they can give you check engine light, they can give you traction control issue light, uh, crews can be disabled, all that stuff because it's all relying on those sensors. So that could be where it's at. As far as the IDS, they don't necessarily have to have that because there's a lot of scanners that do as much and even more than that factory scan tool will do if they have one of those. Of you know, For all I know, maybe they have one of those plug-in Bluetooth things. But you know, um, we, have, we have scanners that will do more than some of the factory ones, and then we have some that will do... You know, 99 things in the factory won't do one that the other one won't, so we have both. Do you ever have to, like, if a customer brings in a car and your scan tool isn't programmed for that, do you have to upgrade it on just to work on that car? It's happened before, but now we have monthly subscriptions we okay. pay for yeah. on several tools that we used to buy you know, once a year. We'd spend almost $2,000 a tool. Now we... They break that out into nice, even monthly payments for right. us. So we Perpetual. pay. Perpetual. Yep. Yeah, and they update. Whenever an update has been released, it is pushed to the tool, and it automatically downloads it so we can get it in there. And I found some updates on some of the newer cars that were, were great. 
they they worked in there a couple of weeks before, and now they're like, well, this tool didn't have this. And now it does. And then you look in the release notes, and it's there, so you can find it. But I think that's how it would have happened. But we always like to check back and find out, look at our work. The, the, I was Did just going to say, leave anything loose? I think they need to go back and just double check because when you do a, a, a big major repair like that, you probably don't want to walk back in the shop and see how the sausage is made. Uh, you, you don't want to see your car exposed like that. Mm-hmm. Embarrassing. But it's um, not hard to take it apart and put it back together no, the but right way. You've got, they have to take off the wiring harness off the engine. They have to disconnect power, like Russ said. They're they're stripping that thing down to a bare long block, especially if they put in a Ford remand. And dropping the frame out the bottom so the right. steering's disconnected. So you have opportunities for mini plug-ins that you need to check. It doesn't happen often, but we've had it before where a connector didn't quite get seated together all the way and it was not getting a good connection, or you had a fuse block that you had to lift up and get a... Um, a bulkhead connector disconnected off of that to go with the engine when it dropped down. And when you put it back in, one of the spades get bent over. It's hard to do because they make this stuff pretty bulletproof. But they should just just take a trip down memory lane on what they touched and just make sure of that. But if not, it, it is possible that it's just something that didn't come back to life. That help you out there, Kevin? Well, it does. So essentially all of everything you just said they did. And um, so this is where we're at at this point. The, the question that c- kept coming up is, how did this engine block crack? And um, mm. they talked to, they have a, a friend, because uh, this shop is not a Ford shop. But one, obviously they know everybody. So he's like, my friend's a Ford master tech, and he said, you know, so this is no rumor. But that Ford knows that there's uh, an issue in the, basically in the, um, you know, the forge or whatever creates these blocks and that there's sometimes a crack between those and they just haven't recalled them because there hasn't been enough of that. But he's seen it many times in that exact position. They had an issue with some, some Ford escapes early models that were the four cylinder that they did issue some Boltons on and things like that. Um, Different engine, but a similar situation. And that same engine was used in a, Land Rover, a Range Rover, the the little one, um, in that same era. Evoke? No, no, you got to go, you got to go back a little further than that. They called it a, I can't say it right now, but it was a little two point three motor in there and similar engine, and uh, so there was a definite chance of a casting forging issue that was going on, and if it doesn't happen quite enough, uh, they 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 were going to be kind of quiet about it. Mm-hmm. And even if it happens a lot, if it's not issued under a safety recall during warranty, an example, a Ford 5.4 and as many of those as we've talked about over the years, if it doesn't come up in TSB, it's a safety thing. Oh, you know, it could leave you, you know, in, in traffic or something. And, or a okay. class action lawsuit. Right. Yeah. That'll change and their mind, mm-hmm. usually. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> but they, yeah, they'll give you a bulletin, though, that, so you're aware of it. But we've seen a lot of those. What we've also seen is the water pump fails on that engine loses coolant and when it loses coolant the engine gets hot and it cracks and it will crack at the weakest place which is that place almost every time kevin thanks very much for the call good luck let us know what you find out 866-594-4150 let's go to north carolina and talk to andrew you're on the end of the hood show what can we do for you andrew how you doing guys fantastic Uh, great (laughs) got a got a good one for you my 99 chevy suburban Got two hundred and I'm sorry, three hundred and sixty three thousand miles on. And up and yeah, that deserves a bottom. Yeah, I mean, it really does. And she was purring like a kitten up until about a month and a half ago. I had a random miss. Started on cylinder four and three, five and seven. So I did the normal, you know, I started with plugs, did wires, did the cap and rotor. And I did the coil. No change. Someone told me, try your fuel filter. I do the fuel filter. No change. Do the fuel pump. Do the fuel pressure regulator. The mass airflow. Map sensor. Uh, and I'm probably forgetting something. But uh, I'm at a loss. I cannot figure out why I'm having this random miss out of nowhere. Well... 
a 99 Suburban, four tech engine, yeah, multi port fuel injection spider, the arachnid yeah. thing. Um, have you put the injector in it? No, no, I did not do injectors, pull the injector, um, but I did test the fuel pressure mm -hmm. on all the injectors, and they're all in line where they should be. Good drop down pressure, sure. everything. Even if they're good, they might be clogged on the pintle end and not spraying a good clean pattern. And at, okay. at that age, if I bought one that was that age and it hadn't been replaced, I'm going to put one in it because of the, the issues they've had with them. Yeah. Even sometimes when they're running, they can have, we've looked at them on a lab scope and I'm looking at all eight of them firing. And as I'm, if it's been updated to the one that has eight separate injectors and as, I, as I'm with the ones on the end too, I'm looking at it and I'm watching and I can see the waveform change randomly as it changes temperature and things so they can cause some misfires that way. The factory one would have had the injector right up at the top of the intake plenum with eight injectors there. And then the aftermarket or the updated factory one moves the, they just have the power connection up there and they move the injector all the way to the end. So the pintle in the end with that stainless is right there in the hole on the manifold instead of being way up high and then having a tube that it has to go through because the, the fuel is released at the top and then runs down this plastic tube and then pushes another pintle open at the bottom. So that can be a weak point on these engines when you get one that's, you know, over a couple decades old, it can yeah. it, it can cause this, you know, issue to, to happen. So that, that could be an issue for the misfire. The other thing you could check would be the leak down. Make sure the engine's good and solid, that you don't have any leakage past any yeah. valves. Because compression could be good, that's, but you might have some leak down going on there. Yeah, that, that's my, uh, that's the next thing I'm going to do, do the a compression test. And then if everything looks good, then, then do the leak down test. But it's just strange, just out of nowhere, which it makes sense. It could be the injectors. You know, that really does make sense. Um, I just hate throwing money at something that's this old. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? but, <laughs> Especially since you already won. He's, well, he's already thrown a fair <laughs> amount of money at it. Sure, but he's... Yeah. So, come on. Because yeah, of the miles had, he's got, yeah, you're yeah. saying he's done pretty well? Yeah. And that, that yeah, I bought wait. it for two grand ten years ago. With how many miles on it then? It had, I think, I think it had 167. Well, yeah, you could spend five grand <laughs> and still be ahead. <laughs> no. <laughs> you don't want to. I know that, but... Well, that's just think about that. He spent two thousand dollars and that's he's driven crazy. it uh, one hundred fifty thousand miles, give yeah. or take. And yeah, and he's just now it's not purring like a kitten. Mm. Good luck with it, Andrew. You, I, whatever you do, I think you you've beaten the odds and you're coming out ahead. I removed a kitten from a vehicle under the hood this week. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, we were trying to help help somebody get their car started. And <laughs> speaking of purring like a kitten, yeah, and uh, the kitten she she goes, "There's a cat under there." And so I'm like, "You have a do you have a stick or something?" I put the stick down to kind of move the cat so I can get at it. Uh -huh. It starts rubbing against it. Oh, sure. Yeah, it's like it's been sitting in the car yeah, for so it long. It starts rubbing yeah. against it. And then it followed the stick right up to my hand, and I picked it by the neck and pulled it up, and it was like my best friend. It wasn't yeah. a scared cat. It was weird. It was a little. <laughs> Did you check to see if there were any others? That was the only one. Okay. It ran away pretty quick, too, but, right. it was, but it was friendly on the removal. Thank we're, goodness. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. 866-594-4150. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show.
Prepare to learn something. You're going under the hood. 866-594-4150. That's the number to reach us here at the Under the Hood Show. Let's go to Arizona and talk to Charles. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Charles, what can we do for you? Um, I'm just looking for some quick help on, on a couple of questions. For one, a 1936 Chevrolet. Oh, we gonna, we're going to have to guess the color of this one at the end, but let's get into the questions first. Okay. Um, it's, it's got uh, 87,000 miles on it. Right now, it's known as what I call either a HQ or a GQ, a hanger queen or a garage queen. But I'm trying to figure out, like, what type of oil to put in. I got a manual here, and it says use SAE number 20 or 20W oil during the summer months. 20W oil during the spring and fall months, and 10W during the winter months. Well, in the winter months here in Arizona, since the car is a queen, it doesn't really run. But in the summertime, if I can get it to go, uh, the temperature appears to get up to over 100. What type of oil would I use? I'm thinking. It has an original motor, a 206 or 207 in it. Yeah, so so here's the thing with... With that car, you're probably going to be, and you're going to have to do a little research on it, but I'm thinking you're probably going to be a 30 weight, but you're going to want to protect the engine because a lot of the modern oils we have right now are not going to take care of the cam and the rods and bearings and everything in that engine like they should. And what we use in classic cars like that often is an oil like Joe Gibbs Racing Oil, and there's a dozen others out there that are very good oils made for this type of thing and in the once a year oil change type of thing that you're going to be doing on a car like this um, winter's not going to matter because you're not because of where you're at your winter right. is not not the winter really, they were thinking of not right. changing viscosity make an engine turn over harder with more friction friction type of thing even if you drove it on a day that wasn't too bad if it's in the garage you start it up pull it out warm it up you know you should be fine but uh, car clubs car clubs are a great place to go to get input from other people as to what oil yeah. they're using successfully. And they'll probably tell you the same thing. Our, our partner over at Berkeley One Classics actually has discounts for car club members. And one of the reasons for that, I would have to guess, is that car club members, being that they talk to each other, they give tips that they've found have worked on their own cars to protect them longer, mm -hmm. which means less breakdowns, less problems that could cause safety issues, which could cause insurance claims. So overall, it's a good deal. And, and they know and that community. people that take the time to be involved in a car club and spend love the time. Their car. They love their car, and they are going to be next level on taking care of it. Now, back to your question, I have, I don't. I would go for like Russet, a Joe Gibbs Racing Oil. I use the car oil. club for me to yep. find out where to, you know, what yep. oil I should use in the Model T. My, my hunch is that straight 20 or straight 30 is probably going to yeah. be fine. Um, and and they've got a lot. Joe Gibbs is not a partner of the show or sponsor in any way, but they're a, I've looked at their products as we've purchased a lot of it for classics, and they carry a lot of weights of oil like that. Yeah, I bought one. Where my, would I get it? Would I have to look it up online and look at it and get the information as to how to purchase the oil there? I mean, what store would go ahead and sell it? Do I Or do I just use something like... Uh, Valvoline thirty weight or Valvoline no, just straight no, twenty no, no, oil. No, no, no. You need an older. You need an oil that still has the zinc in it to ZDDP protect your cam. Protection. That, that's going to be that's very. They took important. that out of the oil in the nineties. Yeah, you, you can. A lot of these, like Joe Gibbs, is you can purchase it at a lot of auto parts stores. A lot of places yeah. do carry. If they don't shelf it, they can order it for you. Yep, and uh, otherwise you can get online and and purchase it that way. You can contact the company and tell them what vehicle you have. A lot of them keep the database of vehicles and what oil is good for it. What, what I've works done it really both well. ways. I've had our local auto parts store bring in a case for me of a vehicle that I needed, and I've also went online when I was in a hurry and and had it delivered right to my doorstep. Um, so I mean, I've done it. I've done it both ways. But definitely, you're, if you've got a connection with your local auto parts store. They can, they, can get they can get it for you if they don't shelf it. Our Sturdivant's Auto Parts Store, which is auto value, they're found in lots of places. If you go online, you'll you'll be able to see what they have in their inventory, and you should be able to purchase it through their online as, as well and have it delivered. that help you out there, Charles? Okay, do you, do you think someplace like, uh, we'll say, uh, O'Reilly's or AutoZone or something like that would be able to get it for yes. me? Yes. 
Those yeah. are the only stores we really have here other than Walmart or whatever, and Walmart's yeah. not going to carry that. Yes, if you were to go into your local O'Reilly Auto Parts stores down there in Arizona, you should be able to find a Joe Gibbs racing oil or equivalent. If not, ask the professional parts people there, and they'll be able to take care of you. Yeah, yeah, they can order it. There, yeah. there are a number of them that, and, and I, you can get online and in nauseam read which one's the best mm-hmm. based on, but you just may need to make sure that it is clearly engineered for that older engine, has the correct zinc and ZDDP or whatever it might be in there that is necessary and as far as yep. finding it some of it's just a crapshoot as to who is in the neighborhood i That's know true. that when i've gone to sturdivants there's one sturdivants that carries what i'm what i go in for because there are people who right so they can get it when it. i go to the one in my hometown find that with the grocery yeah. stores too it's like why do you carry the, the del monte mechanic in a can and this place doesn't you yeah. know that they have the body shop in the can and you know <laughs> all right let's go to your next, your question, yeah, Shannon. He, don't got, don't he, tell us yet, yeah, Charles. I yeah. do have a question on the color of the vehicle. Is it still the original color or similar, or has it been completely changed? Uh, right now, it's what I call battleship gray. It's been primered over. Okay. So I don't know what color. I have to get under the hood, <laughs> open up the cowl, and look. I'm going to guess color. this car is battleship gray. I'm going to go with primer gray. Russ. There you go. That's it. Great. <laughs> you should have said blue. Man, I was just sitting there for Pink. you. We have a little game we play when yeah. people call with classics that we try to guess what color their classic is. Uh-huh. And you didn't play well because you told us the color. <laughs> Which my question was, I think uh, I asked my question wrong. It's the Berkeley one, guess the color of the classic. Do you have white wall tires on it? Uh, no, it's just regular black tires with uh, the the, the, cro- the original chrome hubcaps or whatever. Oh, that's right, awesome. You're going to have to get white wall tires, I think. <laughs> Charles, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. 866-594-4150. Let's go to Colorado and talk to Robert. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Robert, we got just a couple minutes. What can we do for you? Hi, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, so I have a 09 Kia Optima. It's 240,000 miles in it. And since I use it for delivering food, um, the radio in the car only works for when I turn on first on the car and I drive around a couple of hours, whatnot, and until I turn it off. Now the little screen on it comes on, the CD player always works, everything, every button works on it. Even after the fact that I turn on and off the car, it just doesn't generate sound. And I try to check the fuses and everything, everything looks fine. And I was going to replace it, but for that model year, I would have to take off the entire um, dash of the car. Yep. So I was like just putting it off. So what I discovered is if I press the on and off button many, many times, it sometimes comes on and plays music. But it almost seems like when it, after a few hours of driving, again, when I turn off the car, it just will not play music, but it, it does turn on. So what I've been doing is just not shutting off the car <laughs> once the radio is working. That's so I don't know what to do. I, I think it needs to be replaced. The unit is just failing, but instead of replacing that whole dash and changing everything to make it work, I think you could get a, a used one unit from a, like car-part.com. Okay. Have that installed in there and save your money that way instead of changing that whole dash kit and everything. And check at a stereo shop, too, because yeah. you can and they get... Can, a lot of times yeah. they'll put a used one in because they know it fits uh-huh. the dash and they don't want to modify it. But replacing that used unit, that the original unit, it's there's a little bit of an operation to it, but it's it's not bad, typically. They make that pretty easy to get to. It looks a little bit intimidating when everything's covered up, but once you get to it, it's not so bad. Or you can do what I did and just go get a Bluetooth speaker and put the Bluetooth speaker under the dash for... A year and a half or two you years. You did that for a long time in the I priest, didn't you? I did it for a you? long time. I was only going to do it for a month or two, and it ended up being years. Funny how that happens. Uh. All right, Robert, good luck. Thanks very much for the call. That'll do it for this hour of the Under the Hood Show. Jeff and Gary, hang around. We'll talk to you on the after show. That'll do it for this hour of the Under the Hood Show.
Jeff, you're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Hi, um, I have a 2021 Ram. With, it's a Ram Warlock. It's got the V6 motor in it. Okay, and I bought the truck. It's the first brand new, brand, brand spanking new truck that I've ever owned, ever bought. And I bought it for fuel mileage. You know what I mean? I've had, mm-hmm. you know, older vehicles, older trucks, and uh, you know what I mean? The, the eight, ten miles to the gallon. So I went with this V6 thinking I'd get great fuel mileage. Well, I've never gotten better than 15 miles to the gallon out of this truck. Is that normal? It's close. And that sucks for you. Because <laughs> I know what you're up against. You think. Geez, this should be a good deal. But that motor well, is a good good. engine, but it is being taxed oh, pl- it's being taxed plenty heavy in that uh in that heavy truck. And because of that, you no know, they they do a good job trying to gear it and get the transmission set with the gears and everything it, to match the torque curve of the engine, but you're still putting a lot of strain on that V six engine because of the weight of the vehicle that it's moving around. What what was the? Do you remember what the window sticker said? It had like twenty four. It's um. Uh, it, well, how do you drive? What what's your routine? Are you? Um, I'm not. I don't have a lead foot by any means. Um, I don't think that truck. I mean, I live in South Dakota. The speed limit is eighty miles an hour. That truck has never seen more than eighty three miles an hour. But normally, it's you know, right at the speed limit or three or four miles over. Never, and I I don't. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not one of them zero to 60 in two blocks kind of drivers. I'm just, you know, I just, yeah, you know, I got a commercial driver's license, so I don't take chances. Yeah, yeah you're so, a good, you're a good solid driver, it sounds like. That's if good. you, if you fill that truck up with a tank of fuel and try to make it a goal to never drive it over 70, try to keep it 65, but I know... Trying to drive 65 on our interstates when people are you coming up behind over. you doing 90. Yeah. But there are times where, you know, a lot of times where you can do it. Even if you do it the majority of that tank of gas, keep that thing under 70 and see how much it changes. I'll bet you'll add probably three miles to the gallon to that 15 just by doing that. What's the best you've ever seen, Jeff? Uh, 18.9, and uh, I drove from here to Des Moines. So it was on cruise control the entire way, 70 miles an hour. Yep. If you take the trip from Sioux Falls down to Spirit Lake, Iowa, to Okaboji, and you fill up that yep. tank with gas, I bet you if that truck is capable of 24, it'll probably do it in that trip because that's one of the – it's a it's a drive that has a, a lot of long 55-mile-an-hour speed limit areas. Yep. And Every highway. vehicle I've had has got me on Highway 9 there. Has, has, that's where I've got the best fuel mileage because I can't go faster, and it's pretty flat, and it's pretty long, and I use that as a test, and I go, wow, I got great mileage. What a weird. Well, I, I do. <laughs> I do a great. I, yeah, I'm I do want to pause just a bit here, though, with you before we let you go here, Jeff. But when you go to on the Internet, there's like fueleconomy.gov, um, I'd be curious to see what they show for the real world testing and different things that they've done on fuel economy on that is the window stickers. They're supposed to be pretty credible. They've really, they've, they've upped their game on the window sticker. I remember in like Oh seven GM had to reprint a bunch of window stickers cause they had used it. They, they changed the te- testing method. But if you look at that, look at how they rate them. Yep. They rate the highway at national average at a certain speed limit. Yep. They don't rate them like, you know, if the national comes out to be 71, ver, you know, based on summer 85, summer 60 and 55, but that's you, where they do that. But if you look at that real close, that'd be good. You've got a pretty good spread there. I, I do want to make sure that this vehicle's operating Working. correctly. Yeah, because it's pretty low. What? How many miles you got on it now? I, and that, that was my next part of this question. I actually bought this thing as a lease. Sure. You know, I, I have 43,000 miles on it, and I have eight months left to go on this lease. And I, that was my next question. I mean, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna get hit hard on giving the truck back, you know, on the because I'm over the thirty-two thousand. But do I want to do that and just take that five, six thousand dollar hit and get into something better for me? Because I, I mean, I have company trucks now where, you know, I had to wait nine months to get a company truck, which just shot my, 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 my. You know, that 32,000 miles out the window because I had to use my personal truck for it. 
But uh, do I want to give the truck back or do I want to buy it and then try and sell it? And I, I think when, if I, to lease, I would owe like 18 grand on the truck. In today's market, the market is cool. The market has cooled a little bit uh, on trucks um, because it's just it has. The interest rates have went up. People aren't able to get the new ones as easy. Inventories are starting to build back up a little bit at the dealerships. You're starting to see. Um, yeah. I, and having a truck for sale with the V6 in it is not going to be desirable Very. for the majority of the people. I yep. would be tempted to let that lease go back. I'm just telling you, that's my that's my gut hunch. That's, and I, 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 I tended to agree with you, but I knew you guys knew way more. Well, I, I'm not saying well, I'm right. but And I'm, after the first of the year, there may be some incentives coming out from these new trucks coming well, out. I started to see, even like GM, they put us ad out, and at the end of the ad, it was up to $4,000. And I, you haven't heard that for a long time. But they are still so yeah, expensive. The list, price, the list price is so high. So there is still an opportunity for comparison to say, all right, Truly, what is happening in the market? And, you know, we always talked about autotempest.com. They were a partner of ours for a while. But that was a site that did a good job of comparing a bunch of different locales and a bunch of different websites. It'd be interesting to see where that falls you know, to find a truck. Because you can, you can go through and you can choose the engine. You can search by the different types of vehicles. So you're not just comparing to every other mm-hmm. Ram out there. And the other thing is I think that 21 Ram Warlock with the V6 – that's still the classic body style. Um, it's not the the next generation. Chrysler kept making Isn't that. Isn't that what we have? Um, yeah. They, Chrysler kept making that generation, and they squeezed all the squeal out of the pig on that generation that What's they could. What's the mileage he's getting out of that? Do you know? Uh, that's a he V8. He can tell you. Yeah, Tim will tell you. Our guy, our outside salesman, but he's but got a V8. a V8. I thought he said it was like 19 or something yeah, like that. Yeah, he gets that. better than that. And so, I'll say, Jeff, I just went to fueleconomy.gov, and you could – Dial right down to the model you have. There's a bunch on there, and they're anywhere from 17 to 21. Yeah, okay. you, Combined. you do sound like you're trending a little bit behind. Yeah. And that motor, I had the same motor in my Jeep Wrangler, and we had, and other people I know had head problems and um, ended up having to put a motor in mine under warranty. And so there, there could be something going on that it's misfiring a little bit. It typically, you've never gotten a check engine light or anything. No, I've never had a check engine light, but I have felt just some shaking. You know what I mean? It just, this, it just seemed like it did this. This wasn't quite right. Yep. You might you know want to go in and have a state of health checked on it, or just keep driving it and let the lease go back. Jeff, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. Let us know how it goes. Eight six six five nine four four one. Typically, if people bought in the right cycle, Mm -hmm. and if this would have been eight months or a year ago, I would have told him to keep it and sell it because he would have been into it right where Mm -hmm. he could have done well on keeping his lease. But right now, I'm I'm a little more cautious on giving that advice. Let's talk to Gary. Gary, you're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Yeah, I've got a uh, Volkswagen Jetta 2003 that uh, my tack is surging before my engine catch up to it. So as you are trying to take off, your tack is just jumping up to five grand, and the engine you know is not doing that. Or what? Give me, give me some parameters of what's happening. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's five grand. I was being dramatic. Huh. Yeah. That's and it's not holding on a hill when I have it in uh, a cruise control. I start going up a steep hill and it shuts off. I'm just trying to identify if you're having a transmission problem or if it's just a problem with the way the tack is reading. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Does it sound like the engine well, is racing? The engine? Well, yes. I guess. I guess the question I have is: Does but the tack? I have a manual transmission. Okay, well, that could still be like a clutch or something like that, but does, does or transmission, does the, but when the tack moves, does the engine RPMs sound like what the tack is showing you? Yeah. Hmm. But the power is not there at the same time. You don't have the, it's picking up at the same time. And it's a five-speed manual. Yes. Oh boy! So the tack does come up, but you have no no go. Yeah, it's it's like it's 
slipping. I mean, it'll it'll go eventually. It'll catch up eventually as long as I don't, you know, slam on the gas real hard. If you if it was doing that, if it was slipping the clutch that bad, you would think that you would have some, you would have clutch smell, burnt smell at some point. So it does. I don't think that's what it is. I think it's a state of tune issue, it sounds like. But what state of tune issue could he be having, Russ, where he would be gaining RPMs and losing power? Well, you don't have a, ch- a flashing glow plug light, do you? At times? No. Okay. No. Nope. Is it a diesel or a gas? It's gas. Okay. Is it a turbo? No. Oh, good. Well, that. <laughs> yeah, we're just we're just kind of poking around trying to figure out what which way to go with this. Yeah, that eliminates a lot of. I thought, I thought maybe it was a vacuum leak or something, but I can't. I haven't been able to locate. Well, one. typically when your RPMs go up, you're going to gain power. I mean, because what will normally happen is you can't get power because you can't get the RPMs. It's it's just if you're getting higher RPMs and it's and it's misfiring more at RPM, then you kind of wonder about you know, is it is there a timing issue? But that usually gets RPMs will make it. Better, you can usually, you usually get old, you typically overcome bad state of tune and some problems with more RPMs if you can get to that point because it gets going fast enough. It's like I, I don't care about that anymore. I'm still I'm just running fast. Give me some more gas. I'm going to keep cranking this thing. Yeah, um, when they go okay. into limp home mode, yeah, you'll lose power. You give it gas, it kind of falls on its face. You let up, it picks up a little bit, and that's typically combined with a check engine light the same time when you're when it's doing this and you slow down and you get into your lower rpms or into your lower gears where you're 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 decelerating and trying to go around town or whatever might happen to be do you feel like you have power then yeah so when the engine runs well you feel like it's running with the right power that it should and everything right yep as long as you know i don't if i go to like accelerate or pass something then that tackle will jump up, but the engine's not responding as fast as the tack is. Yeah, that's that's a, it's hard for me to kind of diagnose what's going on, but it because it, initially it sounded like you were having a, a like a if it was an automatic a, a, a transmission slippage or when you said it was a straight stick, then you start thinking about a clutch slippage. Mm-hmm. But you wouldn't he smell something by now if he's slipping that much clutch? Yeah, and the tack that if the tack's going up, it's really reading it doesn't look at the accelerator pedal it looks at rpm of the actual engine so it's got to be moving up just maybe not as much it might be might be cutting back on fuel and ignition when he's giving it accelerator so it doesn't sound like it's accelerating but the tax going up because it's actually turning faster but there's no there's no fire there that vehicle's new enough that they could hook a scanner on it while you're driving and they could watch a lot of things they could watch the actual rpms they could watch the 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 rich lean you know fluctuations uh, coming out of the tailpipes um there's a lot of different things that they could check and it, you might have to just get this to a somebody that can hook it up with a live data and drive this car and just see what is happening and see if anything is really out of whack uh, or if it's just a true mechanical problem okay all right i appreciate your time oh, well i appreciate you calling in i would like I said sometimes if we if we could have the vehicle there or have our hands on it, you can give some different ideas. But this one just it's just hard to hard to figure out which which path to go down. So Gary, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. All right, that'll do it for the after show. I think we got stuff to do here. Right. There's something going Russ, on, right? Russ started already. Yeah, we got we got a do we have an interview or something or can't say. I can't it's, it's a, a surprise it's to super me. Super secret, yeah. Okay. All right. Are they here yet? Are the singers here? Uh <laughs> Uh, yeah, that'll do it, I think. I, I'm, you got anything else we need? To, you go sit down. We're doing that. Like, go sit down. I, 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 <laughs> gotta do the thing. Gotta, what? Facebook question? Facebook. There's another one. Another Facebook question. We got the one from Luke. Oh, Push that on here, button. Am I? What's the deal here? <laughs> All right, here we go. I'm getting out of here. Uh, thanks, everybody. I'm going to be surprised yeah. by something here, so. I don't think so. I think you'll be fine. No, okay. Are you want me to do it now? You in? Yeah. Okay. Let's see. You're not in. We're trying to do our video call right. here. I'm in there. I got you there. Did that? Can you see me? No. no. Why did that start during the middle of a listener call? Well, because it was on the after show, so we're we playing were around it. with it. We were trying to get it going. Oh. 
because I was going to just. I thought somebody tried to it. call us and we had an interview or something. There was no. either yeah. that or the, we found out there was a explosive device underneath Russ's I, chair. I should be able to put this headset on right now and just walk away and be like I'm still here. You'd yeah. see me and hear me in the whole bit. Can you but see this. So this is a little bit of R&D going on, which I would not be involved with typically. That's fine, because I'm not the R&D guy. Right, well, which I thought maybe you were driving a semi with that headset on. I thought no, you were it's just <laughs> it's got very good quality. So they are good. Um, I just thought, you know, hey, we get to set up. We use this for our partners and friends and stuff that call into the show, so we can get them. Their face can be up on YouTube. What's it called? What's the AirLink? AirLink. Yeah, yeah we can. We can yeah, talk we've, to each other. Yeah, we've, All right. we were supposed to do an airlink with John Dobson that yeah. Dotson. Universal Technics. We we're actually using this yesterday mm-hmm. or two days we're ago. We're good. I, f- I figured it out. We just gotta gotta, we got to go. We got to go. We got to go do it. We so. can't demonstrate it on the air? No. no. Unless somebody Because we got me. all sorts of, no, we got all sorts of stuff. There's steps we need to do that we can't do until we oh, get out? come over and do it. All right. Well, get out and right. I'll get back in. Goodbye, everybody. Right. Bye-bye.